Well, good morning. Grace and peace to each one of you this morning. Thank you very much for uh, all who contributed. Thank you, Mark, again for moderating. You do such a wonderful job. Thank you, Dad, for that wonderful devotional. Thank you, Devin, for uh, that children's lesson. Um, and again, I'm amazed at, at uh, what Dad had to share and uh, about how it, it kind of ties in with what um, God is, the burden God has laid upon my heart. Um, w- if you would uh, turn to me, turn with me to a, uh, Matthew chapter 7 for a text this morning. going to be reading several verses in Matthew chapter 7. Starting to read in verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the, that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So this morning, um, I would like to enlist your help. I would like to have a discussion, a uh, little bit of a discussion on how. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to compare these two men. What was what was um, similar about each one of them and then what was different? And um, while you're thinking about that, um, I would like to just give a little bit of a history of this. And I'm I'm sure most of you already know what the history is on this chapter here. Uh, Jesus is finishing the Sermon on the Mount. He's, he's um, coming to the end, and this was his last and final. He gave about four warnings um, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and his last warning was about the wise man and the foolish man. That was his last warning. Um, three of these warnings are about self-deception, one is about being aware of the false prophets, that they don't deceive you, in verse 15. And then the other three are about self-deception. And I would like to draw a diagram here. Now, now be, thinking about, be thinking about the difference between the the wise man and the foolish man, because I'm, I'd like to hear some. I'm going to need some help because I, I don't have much uh, written down here today. Um, the other thing that I want to uh, um, say is that, so I'm not sure how it is for, well, I, I know it's, it's not very easy for me. I think I've said this before sometime. It's not easy for me to sit down and study scripture and just come up with my own thoughts. Um, so I do, I do a lot of reading, a lot of studying. I listen to other sermons, and, but I always want to give proper credit where credit is due. Um, these thoughts are not my own. I, um, a lot of these thoughts that I share today, I want to credit to Finney Caravilla. Um, so if some of you have have watched him or heard him speak, and this is basically a repeat of that. I just want to um, credit him for the thoughts that I share this morning. Um, so I'd like to draw this diagram, and we're going to draw another box.
Okay, so um, I don't know. Can most of you see that? Can you? If I stand here, can you see that? Not really. So most evangelicals or nominal Christians look at this view um, as, and this is how I sort of looked at it for a long period of my life as well, that you, you have, you have non-Christians and then you have Christians. There's just, there's just, you're either a Christian or you're not a Christian. But in fact, and today, um, Jesus Jesus uh, taught a lot about this, and he focused a lot of his ministry on another view. And you could, you could, um, you could label this differently. You could, you could label this as um, uh, true uh, dis, um, um, disobedient disciples or true disciples. You can, you can put in here, you know, sort of whatever you want. Um, and then there's, there is, there is the view of over here as just non-Christians, like the world. And Jesus focuses a lot of his ministry. Like if you if you um, read through uh, the, the Gospel of Matthew and and the Gospel of Luke, Jesus focuses a lot of his teaching, a lot of his parables are on are, are right here, defining this line. And. Um, so I think Sil had a message last Sunday on the parable of the sower. There are a lot of parables um, that Jesus talks about this view. Um, and the parable of the sower would define um, that line. Like the, so the, the seed that, was, that the farmer spread was cast on stony ground, thorny ground, and then good soil. And the good soil, then, is the obedient Christians. And the thorny soil and the, uh, uh, when the seed that fell among the rocks, it would be over here. And there are other parables as well. The parable of the ten bridesmaids. Five were ready and five were not. The parable of the wheat and the tares. The parable of the... The wedding feast, the man that got into the wedding, but he actually didn't have a garment on. The parable of the, the ten servants in Luke chapter 19. John records Jesus' teaching on Jesus saying, I am the true vine, ye are the branches. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. So Jesus spends a lot of his time teaching his disciples about how to tell where the, the line is. And that's what, that's what we want to focus on um, this morning. So you've been thinking about the difference between uh, the similarities between the, the, these two men. What came to your mind? They were both building a house. Very good. They both had the same need. They both had the same need? Yeah, they both needed a place to live. <laughs> they both had resources? They both had the same struggle to face. They both had the same desire for shelter. They started it and they finished it. Very good. Okay. That, and we'll get to that a little bit later. There, that would be the, the things that weren't the same 
<clears throat> they both had the knowledge. That's another good point that we want to bring out later. That's what, Mark, what were you going to say? Very good. Thank you all, and just and uh, keep thinking because um, I'll give you more opportunity to um, to give your thoughts. So the word house is mentioned over 1,700 times in the Bible, and it refers to um, it has several different meanings. It's it's an it's a, a place of abode, a place to live. Okay, that would be one meaning. It can mean a family, like the house of David, the house of Pharaoh, or the house of Jacob. It means their descendants. It can mean a church group. In Galatians 6.10, it says, Let us do good unto all men, especially unto the household of faith. Talking about church group, community of faith. It also represents a life. And that's what we want, that's what we want to talk about. That's what it's talking about here in the scripture that we just read. Proverbs says, Wisdom hath builded her house. And that is the meaning of the word here in this. In this um, it, is our, it is our spiritual lives. <clears throat> so they were both building this house. Okay, and I think did someone say something about they both heard. So that was another similarity of, of the two men. They both heard the word of God. They maybe heard it being preached. Maybe they went to Sunday school. Maybe they went to Bible school. Maybe they went to revival meetings. Maybe they read the word of God. There's another similarity. And maybe some already referred to it. I'm not. Another similarity is that. Uh, Junior, did you say they both faced the same things? Like the rains came. The floods came, so they both faced storms in their, in their lives. It says they both got flooded. It says the winds blew and beat upon the house. It gives us the picture that there were several storms, not just one. Not just one storm that came along, but several. Now, what, what was not similar about both men? Mark, you had said something already what was, that you said was not similar. What was that? I said foundations. foundations were different. Yes. Okay, so their foundations were different. There was something else that was not similar about it. About them. Exactly. One, one did something and the other did nothing. He just heard. The difference between these two wasn't information. They both heard the same thing. It was application. So the one applied applied the word of God. The other did not. So another question is, what is the rock in in? So Jesus called the one man wise and the other foolish. That would be another difference in the two men. So what is is the rock then? And the answer is found, I believe. Now, Now, the answer could be different, and I'm not saying that it's not what you might think it is, but I feel it, I believe, I submit to you this morning that the answer is found right here in these in these verses that we read some some people might say well the rock is the word of god the rock is jesus christ the rock is salvation the rock is the blood of jesus and all those things could be true but but in fact jesus did not specifically say that that is what the rock is he said that read let's read verse um Let's read verse 24 again. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, 
I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. So what's the rock? It is applying the word of God. That becomes your foundation by applying the word, by, by listening to Jesus' teachings and applying his principles, Dad talked about this morning, those principles that he lays out for us in the Sermon on the Mount. That becomes our rock. That becomes our foundation. Obedience to the word of God and Jesus' teaching is what creates this rock. It takes effort to be obedient. It takes effort to maintain your relationship with Jesus. The foundation for our lives should be putting God's word, is putting God's word into action. It's not by being born into a good family. It's not by citing some creed. It's not about having a mystical or an emotional experience. It's about applying the words of Jesus and living a life of obedience. So what is the sand? It is simply doing nothing. Hearing and doing nothing equals the sand. A foolish person is often unwilling to apply biblical spiritual truth to life's decisions. And think with me for a moment about the difference between building on a rock and building on the sand. Just, just, just envision what the difference would be between building on a rock versus building on sand. What, what, is, the obvious, what is the obvious difference? Harder. It's okay. Yes, it's harder to build on a rock then it, it's much easier to build on sand. Like there's no effort that needs to be put forth to build on sand, or, or very little anyway. Okay. It's faster. It's way faster to build on sand. I mean, so if you need to just level sand out, most of you, most of you construction workers know that you know, all you got to do is just kick it around a little bit, you know, and, and it doesn't take much effort to push it around. But to dig on a rock... I mean, sometimes you have to get the saw out, you got to cut it, you got to get a jackhammer out. I mean, you got to, there's so many different things that you have to do. It costs less to build on a rock than it would to build on sand. To rent a jackhammer to pound into the rock, to dig away the rock, that, that's costly. It's going to cost you more to apply the word of God. It's going to cost way more to actually put his, put his teachings into practice. I had to, this is a, this is a, um, this is a crude example, but I had to think of Mark um, smoking. Okay, so if you want, if you want some good, smoked uh, pulled pork. So I had to think of Mark, you know, so, so I don't know how many hours it takes him to smoke a pork so that it's just perfect versus going to the store and getting a, going to one, the freezer section, pulling out some a microwave meal, taking it home, throwing it in the microwave, and in five minutes or whatever you have less than five minutes, you have a meal ready. Now, which, which would you rather have? Of course, everyone wants Mark smoke, uh, pulled pork, but look at the time and the energy that it put, that he put into getting that ready. And, and it's always better. And it's no different in our spiritual lives. It takes effort and it's always worth the wait. A theme in the book of Proverbs explaining foolish persons is that They are lazy, hasty, they want quick results, and with very little or no effort. Foolish persons generally throw caution to the wind. Hey, Hey, whatever it takes, we're just going to wing it here. 
They generally don't take advice. They think they have all the answers. And Solomon says that they don't heed warnings or follow instructions. However, a wise person is usually humble. They usually ask advice before making decisions, and they don't let their emotions control their decision-making. There is a parallel passage of this uh, when Jesus uh, spoke the Sermon on the Plain, when he preached that sermon in uh, Luke chapter 6, I would like to read, it reads just a bit different. Luke chapter 6, verse 47. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that, that without a foundation built on built an house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. So here he talks about it, he says that the, well, he doesn't call it a foolish man, but he calls the other man that didn't hear the word of God, didn't even have a foundation. He said he just plopped it on the ground, on the earth. He just started on the earth. And, but he, he says that the, the other man, he digged deep. So, I don't know how many, how many of you know much about skyscrapers. I didn't even look this up, but if I remember right, skyscrapers have foundations that go, if they want to go several stories high, you know, like you got to go several stories deep into the ground in order to have your foundation to, to, hold, a, to hold a building that tall. And the same way is in our spiritual lives. If you want a skyscraper spiritual life, you're going to have to have a large foundation. And that's going to require a lot of hard, sometimes slow work. It's going to require mortifying the deeds of the flesh and studying to show thyself approved unto God. Building on the sand requires no effort. Doing whatever the flesh desires and fitting in with the crowd and pleasing others. <clears throat> I don't want to diminish the power of God, the power of the Word of God. The hearing part of it is very important. I think of the verse, um, for the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. I don't want to diminish the hearing part of it, but then it's what we do with that. And Scripture is full of illustrations and Jesus, a lot of Jesus' teaching, like I said already this morning, a lot of Jesus' teaching focus on on that line of how to tell if you are really my disciple. So, what are the storms then? The winds and the rain and the floods. That is another similarity I, for, I forgot that I didn't bring to mention. It's, well, I think Junior did. They both face the storms and the, the one, the, the person that builds his house upon the rock is not exempt from these storms, okay? You're not going to be exempt, even if you do it right, the way Jesus um, wants us to do it and live out his teachings and his words. We're not going to be exempt from the storms. So what, what could be the storms? Okay, we heard a little bit about it in our prayer time this morning. You know, those, those are storms of life that come against us by losing, losing loved ones. Just many challenges against our spiritual life. I think of suffering and persecution. You know, we don't, we don't experience much persecution here in the in United States, although I submit to you that if we were, if we were radical true believers, these people here would be quicker to persecute us and usually are than these people here. These people here usually show respect. They re show respect for 
for obedient Christians. They're like, wow, that dude, that guy's really committed in his Christian life. These people here are the ones to criticize these people and persecute them verbally, more, more, more or less. Not, not necessarily physically. But that can be... Um, are there any other storms that you... I'm sorry? Accountability. Accountability? Mm-hmm. Yes, that can be a that can be a a storm. That can be the rain, the wind. Your foundation determines your future. And whether or not your life will end in success or ruin. In closing, I would like to tell a story, and this story is might be um, might be a little crude, but I'd like to tell um, <clears throat> so. We as fathers, we love our sons, and we in return hope our sons love us, and we give them, so we give them a job to do. And so, for instance, Judah, he mows, he mows the yard at home, and he does a good job. And, but what, what if, I'm just going to use this as an illustration. So what if I would ask Judah, I would say, okay, Judah, today I would like for you to mow the yard. And he would respond and say, oh, yes, Dad, I would love to mow the yard. And Dad, out of all the fathers in the world, I would pick you. Over all the other fathers in the world, all the other dads in the world, you are the best. I just love you. I'll mow the yard. But then he actually doesn't mow the yard. And I leave, go to work, come home, the yard's not mowed. So I ask him again. I say, Judah, would you please mow the yard? Dad, I just love those words. I just love those words that come from your mouth. And you are the best dad in the world. I just, I just love those words, mow the yard. But he doesn't actually mow the yard. I leave, I go to work, I come back, the yard's not mowed. So then the next day, so the third time, I might use his middle name. I say, Judah Adrian, can you, will you mow the yard? And he's like, Dad, I just love those words. Those words are such an inspiration to me. I'll tell you what, can I get Jason to... Uh, what do you do with that 3D machine that you have and etch it into a plaque? What do you call that? That you can carve? What's that called? Engraver. engraver. Yeah, engraved. Can I get those words, mow the yard? Can I get those engraved on a plaque and hang them up here? Mow the yard. I just love those words. But he actually doesn't mow the yard. You see where I'm going with this? You see what I'm trying to prove with that illustration? There are many people who love Jesus' words, and they even say that they love Jesus, but they don't actually do anything, or they don't actually apply his teachings that he wants us to apply.